Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. Today our journey begins once again in the space plane hangar as this week I decided to try my hand at making an aircraft out of stainless steel by using the new stainless steel fairing colour that was added with the 1.10 update. Of course the fuel tanks and engines themselves can't be fabricated out of steel so I'll be constructing the vessel out of the Mark 1 sized pieces and then encasing as much as I can inside a 1.875 metre fairing. Uh, one of my primary inspirations for this craft shape is the Bristol 188. It's a British supersonic research aircraft from the 1950s and it too is made of stainless steel and it has this really cool almost retro futurism look to it and I liked the idea of building something similar in KSP. Of course my version does differ quite a bit. Firstly mine will upgrade the capacity of the Bristol from one pilot to six passengers and two pilots with extra space in the access pod for a ninth Kerbal if necessary. Top speed is also slightly faster too. The Bristol topped out at a mere 537 meters per second, Mark II, whereas my craft can accelerate all the way into Kerbin orbit and beyond, putting our maximum speed at kind of 2,300 meters per second and beyond once we're in space. To achieve this velocity, I've outfitted my aircraft with two rapier engines for atmospheric flight and a nuclear engine at the posterior of that central fuselage to provide thrust once in space and of course to assist the rapiers uh, in the upper atmosphere. But yes, that's a little summary of what to look forward to over the next 20 or so minutes, so I do hope you enjoy all of the twists and turns that this mission ends up taking. Uh, you can see me currently completing the fairing housing around the two wing mounted engine units. I've never actually built an aircraft this way before so it was definitely a fun learning experience and it was certainly a nice way of getting a slightly more unique aesthetic for this craft. There are a few downsides um, to building aircraft with big fairings around them. Uh, chiefly this SSTO has a much lower range than an equivalent craft that doesn't have these cosmetic steel coverings. And another issue I had was the fact that the wing pieces can't be coloured to the same stainless steel material which ends up making the aircraft look a little bit hodgepodge. I did dampen this effect by slapping two patriotic British flags on the tops of each wing and some liveries on the tail fins as well but nonetheless it would have definitely looked better with the wings simply coloured silver to match uh, the fuselage's colour. The more astute among you may have noticed I've got that little lander can module clipped into the side of the fuselage just there actually. Uh, that's the uh, embark and disembark access for the craft. I thought it'd be nice to have like an actual physical door on the side of the aircraft to make it look a bit more realistic although this did end up coming with its own caveats. For some reason, I've done this a lot using the, that specific lander can as a means of getting kerbals on and off structures and it's always been fine. But I've always clipped it into structural pieces and not fairings. And for whatever reason, even if it's just clipped in like a millimetre of something that isn't even near the hatch is touching a fairing, it will always say hatch obstructed, cannot um, exit. So it's completely non-functional. I learned this as I was landed on Minmus. I don't know why I didn't feel the need to test. I guess my arrogance uh, struck me down. And also I've used this hatch for this purpose before, just not fairing pieces. I never, I never assumed that the fairings would behave differently when it came to the hatch obstructed cannot exit uh, thing. So uh, that was a bit of an oof just there. And uh, yes, all the other cockpits are also touching the fairing. So there is actually no physical way for the Kerbos to get on and off the vessel once it's launched short of just deploying that uh, front fairing module just there. So unfortunately when it comes to doing our Minmus EVA uh, you'll see when we get there but I had to basically deploy the fairing to get the Kerbal out and then I did a quick load once the flag was planted uh, to restore the beauty of the craft. I think I th I, I'm pretty confident in saying that this is probably one of the best SSTOs, uh, best looking SSTOs I should say I've ever made. In terms of being a good SSTO, it's pretty bad. Like I say, a lot of compromises were made to get that nice stainless steel aesthetic. I already mentioned that an equivalent vessel that has all the same specs as this but doesn't incorporate all those fairing pieces would perform a lot better. But this video is about balancing having cool aesthetics and some functionality as well. Now. Here you can see me on the runway. I'm just waiting till we get to about 90 meters per second before we start tipping up. We're going to carefully watch that nuclear engine at the back as well to make sure it doesn't hit the tarmac. But it didn't. It was fine. 
and then we get to probably the hardest part of this mission because this SSTO is incredibly difficult to fly for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it only just has enough fuel to do a Minmus return trip, so we'll be needing to ensure that we fly as efficiently as possible for the entire flight. But secondly, and this is where I say this part is the most difficult part of the mission, the two rapiers can't actually provide enough thrust to get us anywhere near space. Uh, they just don't have the thrust weight ratio to push a craft of this size. They can, they can get us to about 370 meters per second if you really hug the surface of the sea, where, you know, there is the most air for them to use. However, Scholars among you may be aware that the rapier engine provides a lot more thrust once travelling faster than 440 meters per second. So, our flight plan consists of us trying to accelerate as much as we can on engine power, and then once we stop accelerating, we're now going to start diving down towards the ground in a power bomb maneuver to gain the remaining 100 or so meters per second of speed to unlock the maximum thrust of our rapier engines. It's a difficult and dangerous maneuver, but it is necessary. Interestingly, this is how um, a lot of early supersonic flights were done back in day. You know, some of the first supersonic test pilots, they enter the supersonic speed by having the plane do a power bomb maneuver. There are some claims that some propeller aircraft from the World War II era actually broke the sound barrier, though most of these claims have been, are disputed and I don't think anyone really accepts any of them as being an actual example of a propeller powered aircraft breaking the sound barrier but this is now me saying this is just my armchair knowledge of the subject so maybe there's an obscure case that I don't know about but I'm pretty sure that whilst there have been pilots that claimed they broke the sound barrier in propeller powered aircraft by making a power bomb maneuver I don't think any have been definitively proven. Uh, of course as we all know the first supersonic aircraft to uh, achieve the sound break the sound barrier I should say would be a better choice of words uh, in level flight was the Bell X1 which was a rocket powered plane and uh, you know it's 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 a really cool looking plane actually um it's it was just it would just look like a, a child's drawing of a supersonic plane maybe it's because like children are exposed to what supersonic aircraft look like that's what they draw but if i was i remember when i was a young lad drawing like little airplane fighters i would often make them look like a, a bell x1 it just looks like a pencil and it's yellow with two stubby wings and that's it I love it. It's a really, really cool looking aircraft. Uh, this is not that. This is slightly more complicated. This is uh, obviously based on the Bristol 188, but that's interesting I described the Bell X1 as a pencil because uh, the Bristol 188 had the nickname the flying pencil because of its incredibly pointy shape. Or was it the flaming pencil? I don't know. I should have done research, but I didn't, so whatever. Anyway, as you see, we are now entering the upper atmosphere, so now the air is getting sufficiently thin that we can fire that nuclear engine and actually have it provide some meaningful level of thrust we are now once you pass the 20 kilometer mark the rapier engines really do start gasping for air the thrust will start dropping so i'm just keeping an eye on our surface speed once it stops accelerating or indeed you know starts dropping then i just hit action group two and fire up the closed cycle mode of the rapiers which is less efficient and it requires oxidizer as well but it provides a lot more thrust and it doesn't depend on it's no longer dependent on atmospheres to feed the engines so you can use it to kick ourselves into orbit but i didn't want to do too big a burn using that mode of the rapiers because like i say it's not a very efficient way of burning and efficiency is key here ladies and gentlemen so i only did a very a relatively short burn with the rapiers in oxidizer mode or your closed cycle mode and uh, we're going to get the rest of the way into orbit using the nuclear engine and it's going to be a very long burn because the thrust to weight ratio of that nuclear engine is very very poor and obviously our dry mass is pretty high so really our little nuclear engine is going to struggle quite a bit but this setup was really the only way we could achieve this mission profile and obviously keep the aesthetic i was going for and i think it was worth it i just really really can't get over how much i like how this craft ended up turning out i really do think it matches that kind of retro futurism look Oh, I've got a very cluttered low curb in orbit just there. I quickly disabled uh, the probe visibility on the map screen. But yeah, I've got a lot of I got a lot of junk floating up out here. I mean, Lown Aerospace 2, the second one save file, is over a year old at this point. I don't know if at some point it might be worth doing a reboot of Lown Aerospace, but uh, I don't know, I've already done that twice now. Maybe I could do it in career mode, but I always felt like career mode 
doesn't really lend itself that well to the, to a YouTube series because there is a lot of monotony. A lot of people have asked me to do hardcore career where you set everything to be as difficult as possible. So you basically get no science rewards or very, very low science rewards, very, very low funding rewards. Science spawns at a much slower, a much lower rate. But I'm like, but that's going to be so boring to watch. I'm going to have to do just billions and billions of test flights for like testing parts over and over and over again for years to get anywhere in the tech tree. So I respect, I thank you for your suggestion, but it is a respectful uh, no. One issue I had actually with this craft here, you may have noticed, I guess it's not an issue with the craft. It's an issue for me as a YouTube content creator. I've said before in many videos that uh, YouTube's com the way YouTube compresses videos that you upload to it, uh, it makes videos darker. And when we're on the night side of a planet in Kerbal Space Program, it can make it so dark that you can't see what's going on. I do bump up the ambient lighting in the game and I try and put lights on my vessels to make them easier to see. But the actual stainless steel fairing on this craft just goes completely jet black when it's on the night side of a planet. So it can be difficult to see. So I guess I did mention earlier that, you know, the fact that the wing pieces aren't made of stainless steel as well is a detriment to the aesthetic of this craft. But I think maybe... Perhaps as a video, it worked out better because now you can always see it. And we've got those big, obnoxious Union flags there on the wings. Just because we're celebrating a British design that I then modified beyond recognition. But hey, I am British, so I guess it all works out in the end, eh? And uh, I don't know if anyone's going to mention it, but yes, I put UK Space Agency on the tail fin just there. That's because this is a collaboration between Lan Aerospace and the UK Space Agency. Uh... I don't know if anyone would mention it, but just in case anyone mentions that we've got a different space agency on the tail fin, that's why. I just like the look of the UK Space Agency's logo, and I've never really managed to use it in a video before. Why not do it on this, in a video where I'm trying to cover up uh, the bare wings with things? Although that being said, it doesn't really hide the design of the wing very well. The tail fin very well, I should say. Anyway, as you can see, we have completed our Kerbin to Minmus transfer burn, and we are on a Minmus encounter. Does need a bit of refining, that's why we're going to do a quick uh, inclination change halfway to the minty old moon, but I did consider doing my uh, curb into Minmus burn uh, over two burns, if that makes sense, to maximize my use of the Oberth effect. So I think the burn itself was about 920 meters per second, so maybe splitting it into two kind of 460-ish meters per second burns. Uh, that would have been a slightly more efficient way of flying just because the longer you spend burning close to periapsis, the more efficient you are, uh, at least when it comes to doing prograde and retrograde burns. However, uh, the delta V saving wasn't that big, and although the delta V levels were close, it wasn't so close that I needed to do a two separate burns to get to Mimus. I thought, you know what, let's just live dangerously. Uh, we've got 750 meters per second remaining by this point. It's plenty to get back. I mean, once we've got, once we've landed on Minmus and then have got back into low Minmus orbit, it will take a very, very small amount of fuel to get back to the Kerbal Space Center's runway because as soon as we have an encounter with Kerbin's atmosphere, we never need to use our engines again if we time it right. So I don't, I'm trying to think, I don't think I actually used the engine at all after getting my first uh, aero brake encounter as in like i managed to get my orbital line to intersect intersect Kerbin's atmosphere from mimus i'm pretty sure i don't fire the nuclear engine once after that if i do it's only very briefly so oh this is exciting i mean i'm recording this commentary on a thursday and i finished recording the footage on wednesday so it's been a, it's been a, it's been 24 hours guys my memory uh, it's like on a cycle it's on a 12 hour cycle i just don't remember so this is uh this is going to be as exciting for me as it is for you. I'm not sure what I was trying to say with that uh, with that tangent just there, but there, uh, look at that. I realized that it actually looks really, really cool by enabling the uh, the interior cutaway camera mode in the game. So I thought, oh, we should have a little shot of the uh, the exposed windows. It looks a little bit like the, uh, is it the de Havilland Comet that had the square passenger windows, which unfortunately was also uh, the plane's downfall. The initial jetliners that traveled the Atlantic had big square windows, which were really nice because you've got a really nice view out of them as opposed to the uh, the tiny little portholes that modern planes have. The downside is that they uh, they were very, very susceptible to uh, <laughs> stress and fatigue, and uh, they caused planes to crash, basically, the long and short of it. But 
the the doing the cutaway view kind of looked reminiscent to that. And again, it's kind of a retro futurism sort of look. This space plane as it hops and skips about on the surface. I was like, what is happening? Why is it doing this? I didn't realize that I still had physical time warp enabled, and I think that's what was causing it to skip and jump about like this, but I didn't notice for an embarrassingly long amount of time. I was like, let's just try and change the friction control and brakes and see if it works. Uh, but it's done now, and as you can see, the hatch is obstructed, and Valentina cannot exit. And it was a big, sad moment. And I know you could make an argument that part of the door is touching the fairing just there. Trust me, I then reverted the flight. Well, I didn't revert the flight, but I went back to the space plane hangar and literally offset that that lander can in as many different orientations as I could to try and get it so that Kerbals could use it. And literally, I mentioned this whilst I was building the plane. I clipped it so the entire thing, aside from maybe a couple of centimeters, uh, was separated from the fairing and it was still saying hatch obstructed. So for whatever reason, if a if like a, a crew module is touching a fairing in any way, I guess the hatches will always be obscured because it, I don't know if the game thinks it's encased in a fairing and therefore it's not usable. I'm not quite sure, but it is a little bit disheartening, especially because with the latest KSP 1.10 update, um, I got a feeling that Squad wanted to encourage people to use the fairings for structural things more because A, they've added this really nice new color scheme among others, but also you can now uh, create fairings that don't have an end cap, like you could make uh, chimneys as Danny kindly demonstrated for us. So it was clear they wanted fairings to be more versatile in terms of creating you know, nice structures. It's a shame that they've kind of dampened that ability by having this ridiculously harsh, uh, you know, hatch obstructed thing. Hopefully it's a glitch that gets ironed out, but I don't know. I feel like that with every update, there's some other restrictive thing that gets added. Uh, landing gear still suck, by the way. When's that going to get fixed? But also, I, one thing I didn't get is the fact that you can't quick save now if you're 500 meters uh, above a surface or closer. Like, if I'm flying a 400 meters above Kerbin on jet engines and I'm stable, I should be allowed to quick save. It would just say cannot quick save when about to crash, even if you're in perfectly level flight. It's ridiculous. I don't understand who asked that feature or why it was needed, uh, but it was added, and uh, I don't know anyone that appreciates it. Luckily, it can be edited out fairly easily. Like, you can just go into a one of the game data files with in notepad or something and just change the 500 value to like zero or whatever uh but that takes a lot of effort and i can't be bothered to do that if you want to know how to do it you can just google it i think it was like a reddit thread fairly close to the top of google because come on google search is better than reddit search when it comes to finding reddit posts i think we can all agree oof sorry i feel like the commentary got a little bit negative just there i still love you squad uh, I do it because I love you. I recently spent too much money on the new Kerbal Squishies. <laughs> I love the name of them. This is so ridiculous. It's the Kerbal Squishy. It's just a squishy jeb. <laughs> they are quite expensive what they are, but they're so adorable. I'll put a I'll put a little picture on screen. No, actually I'm not. I won't. You should check out my Instagram where I posted a picture of the squishy. See, I'm doing I'm doing cross social media platform promotion like an actual youtuber does so there you go instagram.com slash matt Lown. i think my username is matt Lown. i don't know if it's matt underscore Lown or if it's just matt Lown or one word oh exciting i can't imagine there's many usernames that have the words matt and Lown in them so hopefully i'm a fairly easy person to find but yes i really like the kerbal squishies they are adorable i love them but look at that, we are we have just completed our Minmus to Kerbin return burn, and we have a basically no fuel left whatsoever. We've got a mere 60 meters per second to somehow maneuver our way to the Kerbal Space Center. I did mess up my time warp a little bit just there and accidentally time warped a little bit too aggressively, and we ended up dropping out of warp in the middle of our atmospheric entry. I don't know if I'd done things in air quotes like properly and something might have exploded. I'm not quite sure. It would have been an easy fix to just reload a quick save and drop my periapsis to be a slightly higher height. But regardless, it worked. So I'm like, you know what? Let's just let's just keep doing it. If we do more aggressive error breaks, then uh, the video will be shorter. I feel like this part of the video always drags a little bit because it's just me doing air breaks over and over again, and it looks pretty repetitively. Repetitively? It looks pretty repetitive. Interestingly, 
the uh, the little communitron dish just there on the back on the top of the craft. I forgot to uh, retract it a couple of times on atmospheric entry, and it didn't break, which is kind of weird. And I'm not there's no bamboozle here, guys. Like re-entry heating is at normal, and I've not got any cheats enabled, so I'm not quite sure how that thing managed to survive. Maybe because it's on the top of the spacecraft, it just is shielded. I'm not quite sure, but that was kind of a, a weird thing that happened. Oh. And there you go, I, I did tell a lie earlier when I said I don't use the nuclear engine again. I did do a very, very small burn just there of about 13 meters per second. Just to fine tune my encounter with the Kerbal Space Center a little bit. Now you can see me flying a lot flatter. I'm trying to influence the way my orbit drops down so that we end up on a course that takes us over the Kerbal Space Center. So I don't want to aerobrake as aggressively as before because I don't want my pet my apoapsis to drop down too much, which is why I'm trying to basically just follow the prograde marker here. So we're having we have a nice aerodynamic profile so that we don't slow down quite so much so we've got enough space ahead of us to coast forward and get ourselves on a heading that takes us to the Kerbal Space Center and that should be happening imminently so here we go what do we think guys is this is this the final I think this is the final entry should I zoom out on the Sony Vegas timeline no I will enjoy it with you guys. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure this is it, actually. So yeah, uh, unfortunately, the Kerbal Space Center is on the nighttime side of Kerbin, which is a shame from a video point of view. I've already gone over, you know, how YouTube makes videos darker, and you know, it can be quite difficult to see. I think I like to think that hopefully the fact that the SSTO is covered in fire makes it easier to spot. Uh, but I'll be doing a lot of this from the map screen, a because you can see a bit more, but also you can see what I'm doing here. Our inclination wasn't correct, but we can use the atmosphere to steer ourselves and glide to a more desirable angle. And then we can just basically watch out for the Kerbal Space Center, which was actually quite difficult. I don't think I've ever actually landed at the Kerbal Space Center's runway at night, or at least not for a very long time. Because I'm like, where is it? I can't tell where it is. I'm used to being able to see it during the day, and it's really easy to spot. And suddenly at night, especially with my mod there that adds all those city lights, it was quite difficult. So I just sort of aimed towards it using the nav ball. And it all worked out well in the end. There's a little real-time shot just there, so we can see the Kerbals in their cockpits ready to anticipate the landing, or at least the pilots. One downside of this aircraft's design is that the actual passenger bays themselves, uh, there's no way you can view outside the window. I really should have played this mission. I should have done more of this mission with the interior cutaway view now I think about it. But, uh, whatever. We live and learn, don't we? Maybe in a future video I'll try and... Make something like that. And here's another little weird thing with the fairing stopping things from working. Only one of the front landing gears actually deployed, even though they were placed symmetrically right next to each other. Only one deployed. I mean, I'm thankful. I'm very grateful that one did deploy. Would have been a real shame if they didn't. Although, I think you can actually toggle the, the, the landing gear to deploy within a fairing. So, I don't think it would have been too disastrous. But I'm, I'm glad it worked. My actual backup plan for the uh, landing gear not deploying was me just gliding and landing in the sea. Uh, but it was fine. We managed to do an actual runway landing. So it's all good. And we'll quickly time warp to the day to get a lovely swan song shot of this craft as it deploys its useless cosmetic ladder. And then we can do a dramatic epic zoom out and, you know, get a feel for the wonderful world around us. Got a bit hippy just there. <laughs> on screen, there are links to things you may have noticed. On the left-hand side is a video chosen for you by YouTube's kind of recommendation algorithm based on what you watch. The right-hand side is my most recent upload, so probably a Planet Coaster video. Uh, subscribe, Patreon, all in the description. You'll also find links to social media that I mentioned earlier. And that's it. Goodbye.